Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Letts. I'm CEO of the Brampton Board of Trade. I want to welcome you to the Brampton Board of Trade's expert interview series. This series is an impactful uh, series that we started about a year ago uh, with the advent of the pandemic, a series of very practical interviews with experts that can help us not only navigate through uh, the pandemic, but thrive through the other side. Uh, today, uh, we have a, an extended version of our expert expert uh, interview that will focus on a very important uh, topic, and that is uh, anti-racism in the workplace. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors uh, for uh, making today uh, possible. That includes uh, the Toronto Pearson, GTAA, uh, CN, uh, Deloitte, uh, and uh, Goodison Insurance. Uh, today, I have as my uh, guests um, some very powerful women that are very knowledgeable on this uh, topic. And uh, I want to begin by uh, welcoming uh, my co-host, uh, the incoming chair of the Brampton Board of Trade for 2022, Donna Fagan-Pascal. Donna, uh, many of you know, uh, is a leader across Canada, a leader in our business uh, community uh, as the VP of uh, HR. Uh, communication and uh, public relations for Dynacare, a uh, very important uh, health and wellness uh, company uh, in uh, uh, Brampton and across uh, our country. Uh, our guests today include Nandini Dasgupta, Managing Director and Senior Partner with Boston Consulting Group Toronto. She has uh, uh, co-authored uh, an amazing uh, report, which we will uh, talk about. Uh, about today, uh, which is the uh, pervasiveness of uh, anti-Black racism in the workplace. And we're also joined by the CEO of Civic Action, a uh, premier uh, engagement, civic engagement organization in the greater Toronto, uh, Hamilton area, Leslie uh, Wu. I'd like to take a moment just to let you know a little bit more about the backgrounds of our uh, guests uh, today. Uh, Donna pa uh, uh, Pascal Fagan has uh, Fagan Pascal has uh, been uh, uh, has served uh, in senior HR executive roles for several Fortune 500 companies over the last 20 years. In her current role, she uh, manages a team of 35 professionals, and they're focused on creating an inclusive culture that inspires grows talent and allows employees to thrive both at work and at uh, home. She uh, has an undergrad uh, from the University of Western Ontario. So do I, go, go Stangs, uh, as well as uh, the Rotman School, uh, an advanced certificate in human resource uh, management and uh, a University of Windsor uh, Faculty of Law certificate in alternative dispute uh, resolution. She also holds a certificate as a human resource uh, leader from uh, the HRPA, Human Resources Professionals Association. Um, she uh, has uh, been a director of the Brampton Board of Trade since uh, 2017, and as I mentioned, will uh, take over as chair next uh, year. Uh, Donna has uh, many accomplishments, uh, of course, being named well, one of Can Diversity Canada's top influential women in diversity and HR uh, in 2013. Leslie also is a respected leader with over 25 years of experience building sustainable communities uh, throughout our uh, region. She assumed the CEO uh, role of Civic Action uh, relatively recently, last fall, September 2020. Uh, she is uh, no uh, a stranger to the Brampton uh, Board of Trade, though, in the Brampton uh, community. Uh, before joining Civic Action, she was the uh, Chief Planning and Development Officer for Metrolinx, and Metrolinx uh, certainly has lots of wonderful plans uh, for uh, Brampton. She is an accomplished leader named Biz Now's 2019 Toronto Most Powerful uh, Women in Commercial Real Estate. Also one of Canada's Top 100 Most Powerful Women in 2017. She was named uh, that by uh, WXN. And uh, Spacing Toronto's Transit change maker in 2016. She uh, also is one of Canada's Women's Infrastructure Networks 2015 Outstanding Leaders and uh, founder of uh, a website, uh, shebuildscities.org, and is a strong, powerful voice uh, to am that amplifies and celebrates uh, other uh, women city uh, builders. Welcome, Leslie. And uh, Nandini, Nan Adesgupta is, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, with Boston Consulting Group. She is the managing director and senior uh, partner, and uh, she leads uh, BCG's people and organization practice in Canada. Uh, in uh, that uh, role, uh, she's responsible for bringing about uh, uh, organizational transformation efforts across financial services, retail, consumer, and industrial good, uh, goods industries. Uh, she's contributed extensively to uh, social uh, impact domain of many many uh, uh, corporations and is one of the leaders of BCG's Center for Canada's Future. She is on the board of Civic Action, uh, the Leap Pico uh, Center for Social Impact and a member of the Ivy Advisory uh, Board as well. She has three kids and uh, an active uh, sports, fun and travel uh, lifestyle. She received her MBA from another Western grad. This is wonderful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, a master's in electrical engineering from U of T and uh, a, a honors electrical engineering degree uh, with a minor in management from McGill. So welcome. I'm so happy uh, that all three of you are able to join uh, me today. Let's uh, get right uh, uh, to it. This uh, report, The Pervasive Reality of Anti-Black Racism in Canada, I've reviewed it a couple of times now, and it I think it makes a very significant contrast contribution or contributions, one, in identifying how anti-Black racism manifests itself uh, in the workplace, but also the magnitude. I was really struck by that. And, and I guess that's my first question. What does the data tell us? So I'll post this to Leslie and Nan. What does the data tell us about the lived experiences of Black uh, individuals across Canada, especially in uh, the workplace? Shall I start, Leslie? You can yes, pile please. on again. Yes, Excellent. please. Excellent. Please. Well, thank you, Todd, and, and honestly, thanks so much for having us here. We're really, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be able to share some of this, this work and findings with you. What we tried to do with the report is really compile data that exists. You know, what we found when we set out to do this work in uh, last summer was that, you know, there have been some fragmented studies. It's not a new problem, but there was no sort of commonplace to really gaze at what we know and take stock really of what is the situation and what is the depth of racism in Canada against Black communities. So that's what we set out to do. And, you know, over the course of the work, we surface findings in four different life cycle areas. And I'll get in a moment to, you know, the magnitude question that you, that you posed in terms of what we found. But the life cycles that we looked at um, were education, employment, healthcare, and policing. And what we you know, found, and really just we're just scratching the surface by looking at these areas, is that our Black Canadians, our Black communities face systemic bias and racism throughout their lives, from, from the moment of birth or entry into the country, right through to going to school, right through to, you know, accessing care from healthcare, right through to finding a job and being able to prosper in that job, and certainly how they ultimately end up in the justice system at times um, with more bias in that system. So, um, you know, across the board, we found that. If we double click now on the question about racism as it relates to job opportunities, what we found is there's a reduced likelihood of Black Canadians succeeding in the job hiring process for a bunch of different factors, which I'm sure we'll get into. And then once in the hiring process, once employed, the career progression is, is impaired, essentially. It's more difficult to advance and achieve those leadership positions, board positions, et cetera. So compared to white job seekers, when it comes to actually finding the jobs, Black job seekers tend to be more negatively impacted by unnecessary credentialism, which makes it difficult to actually even be, you know, in, in, in the slate, if you will, considered for the job, uh, often less able to obtain jobs through personal networks. Those networks are harder to form for many of our Black colleagues and, and prospective colleagues. Uh, we find there's often discrimination in the very initial parts of resume screening. You know, over-credentialism is one thing, but even when looking at apples to apples credentials, you know, there's, there's some bias often seen in the, in the screening itself. And then as they go through the process of hiring, of, you know, getting to know a company, many Black people are unlikely to see someone who looks like them, role models, evidence that, you know what, there is a successful Black person in this company, someone who looks like me. And that is a challenge in terms of really feeling that they can be successful in the role. So as a result to the magnitude question, Todd, as of September 2020, the unemployment rate for Black Canadians was 11.7%, which is 1.6 times the rate 
for non-minority Canadians. Black adults earn 80 cents for every dollar earned by non-racialized Canadians, even when both groups have university degrees. So, you know, same backgrounds, we see that discrepancy in terms of earnings. Half of our black employees in Canada report experiencing racial discrimination in the workplace. And honestly, that is massively underestimated, but it's a good half of black employees. And nearly 60% of black people experience microaggressions on the job and feel that they have to code switch switch or adjust, you know, their style, their style of speech, their background, their behavior to integrate and feel like they can be part of a non-Black workforce. Nan, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And uh, I, I do want to come to uh, uh, Leslie uh, and get your perspective on how this report is different and, and, and what it adds. I'm wondering if I could uh, ask Donna to, to chime in, though. Um, Donna, uh, on our board of directors at the Board of Trade, we've had conversations about what it means to be uh, anti-racist uh, and the the, ac the actions required uh, in order to do that. And when I was listening to Nan and, and I, I read through the report, um, Nan mentioned a, a, a couple of things uh, about um, credentialism uh, as being a barrier uh, to for job seekers. And then also she mentioned microaggressions and I wanna explore that as, uh, as well. But these are um, uh, two, I think, important concepts that we might wanna uh, drill down a little bit more on what it means and, uh, and, and more importantly, how do we address them so that fairness is brought to back to both the, the hiring and uh, uh, the uh, uh, performance in the workplace. So I, I just noticed in the report uh, uh, that three, that. Uh, three times less likely, black job seekers are three times less likely for uh, to to um, uh, be in interviewed in the process uh, with black sounding resumes uh, with respect to getting callbacks compared to white sounding resumes. And 65% of employers will reject qualified black job seekers due to credentialism. Could you just reflect in your role as a, an HR executive and, and lived experience, how we um, can address these issues? Uh, thanks, Todd. I think, um, you know, first of all, um, I want to credit Nan and Leslie. I think the report was, is absolutely fantastic. And, um, and you're absolutely correct. A lot of this data and information has been very disparate. Um, and it's nice to see it all kind of compiled, but it is somewhat, um, you know, when I look at this, um, unfortunately, it was like a checklist for me in terms of my personal experiences uh, as being a Black Canadian and also being a, a leader, uh, you know, throughout my career, and I've encountered this. I would say specific to your question around credentialism, um, I mean, I think it is, I think a lot of credentialism and microaggressions are tied into an unconscious behaviors and, un, you know, and basically unconscious bias. I don't think people intentionally go out in life to, um, you know, in, you know, put in place or entrench systemic racism. I think they're adapting well-established practices, procedures, norms that they've learned over time, whether they have colonial roots or racist roots or, um, and oftentimes they're just, you know, acting on what they know and what they see. Um, and I think working with organizations to, um, you know, teach uh, their employees, teach their um, leaders about unconscious bias, about things like credentialism and really doing the work. And I can give an example. When I worked at an organization um, previously, I led the employment equity uh, division uh, and the talent and the recruitment division. And they purposely tied the two together because they could see that they could not attract qualified diverse applicants um, through their normal streams. And they felt if I can bring someone with a lens of employment equity and then bring the talent lens together, maybe I can you know, um, break down some of these barriers. And what we looked at doing at that time, we actually reviewed every single process and some of the simple things of the mechanisms in which people could apply. Um, was it leading to people to be at a certain social economic status that, that you know, only people that had access to certain types of technology or equipment could apply? 
Um, we looked at, you know, the credentials that we were asking people to do. Was it, you know, and, it, and, it, and when we realized a lot of the credentialism that was going on was also about where people got their, received their education. So if you had education outside of Canada, all of a sudden you were completely discounted. And when we really questioned that, why are we discounting someone that, you know, was educated at a university in Africa or in the Caribbean or in another part of the world, which was non-white. And we started to adopt a different practice of saying, wait a second, why don't we do an equivalency? Why don't we make sure that we're using, we get somebody to help us do an apple to apple comparison. So things like that, actually reviewing each practice and making sure you're, um, you're applying kind of an equitable um, process um, and also making sure that do you really need that skill set and and remove any unnecessary skill. Oftentimes, managers will load in requirements that are really not necessary. They just they just want the best applicant, but it may drive you to a very smaller segment, you know, a non-white segment. No, it may not drive. It may allow that you know all of a sudden you have a non-white group being completely excluded from the process. So I think by reviewing practices in detail in looking, making sure they're equitable, questioning why you're making certain decisions, I think will drive um, those kinds of, um, uh, eliminate those kinds of barriers. And I think teaching your leaders and your frontline folks about microaggressions, about unconscious bias is a critical step in breaking down some of these challenges. Thank you for that very specific example. And I want to go to uh, uh, Leslie uh, now. Um, and uh, I, I just want to, just play back because I think it's important to repeat, uh, uh, Donna, that example that you gave was very, very good. And uh, the response um, is, uh, as you said, um, make sure that when you're looking at the, when you're doing job postings, uh, when you, it's, it's natural to ask for the world with a gazillion bu uh, bullet points uh, for candidates that you're, you're looking for, uh, but you run the risk if there are unnecessary uh, bullet points in there that limit your pool, as you say, and might therefore limit the diversity, the diversity of experience of candidates. And when you limit that diversity, you, you limit the innovation, you, uh, 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 you, you limit the competitive advantage of uh, your, uh, your organization. So you gave some very good uh, uh, tips there on actions we can take uh, to ensure uh, that uh, we're not doing that uh, consciously or unconsciously, uh, but uh, ensuring that we have just the credentials that are most important in order to interview uh, the broadest spectrum of people that can bring uh, that diversity and that innovation to our workplaces. Leslie, uh, um, uh, Donna finished and, and Nan has already mentioned uh, about microaggressions as well. So two questions to you, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, your perspective on this report and uh, uh, what uh, important contributions it makes. And then I wonder if we can go to that, uh, that second component, microaggressions. We all know what overt racism looks like, uh, but uh, men, it's much more prevalent to have microaggressions that uh, uh, are equally uh, detrimental to the individual and to the organization. And I'd like to explore what we can do to identify it and, uh, and, and to address it as well. But uh, please, uh, your, uh, your, your overall perspective. Yeah, so so thanks so much, Todd, and thanks for um, the opportunity to to be here with with the folks from Brampton. Um, just to, to sort of uh, go back a little bit uh, on the very first comment you made about the report, which is about the kind of scale and magnitude, and and the fact that the um, that was also my reaction when I read the um, report for the first time, and and you know it speaks to the one of the very first facts put put out in the report that most Canadians don't actually think we have an issue of uh, anti-Black racism in Canada. And so before we even get to addressing the problems, we have to actually acknowledge there is a problem. And I think that's the one thing that the report is very, very important to do is to identify the extent to which the problem of um, uh, anti-Black racism is in almost every aspect, as Nan started out by saying, and that in fact, well, at the same time, you know, it's it, the, the percentage of uh, Canadians who actually don't believe that we have a problem far exceeds 
the number of black Canadians who actually have identified uh, whether it's microaggressions or the range, full range of racism uh, that they painfully experience uh, over a lifetime. And so I think that for me, the report is really important to bring, put facts on the table that can help inform action. And um, so that's step one. Step two is I think the report also points to a number of what we refer to as promising practices. So it puts on the table examples where organizations from around the world, and BCG has done an amazing job to collect a few of those examples, specifically just in speaking to some of the issues that Donna talked about, things like blind screening to remove names from resumes and cover letters uh, when going through an interview process, or um, uh, the idea of the hiring or recruitment uh, panel. Uh, what, who's on that panel and the kind of uh, uh, diversity. And, and you talked a lot about the, the kind of skills-based versus uh, academic-based qualifications and credentialism. So for us at Civic Action, I think one of the most critical things that um, the report has done is also widen the, um, and widen the scope of the conversation, but at the same time, understand there's this interconnectivity going on between uh, numerous sectors that needs to be a conversation that should continue. And, you know, we have been in this space at uh, Civic Action for a while insofar as we had started the conversation about bias against young people uh, entering the workplace, uh, which was one of the triggers for us initiating the Hire Next, um, our Hire Next program, which I, I can talk about some more uh, after. But uh, I think the, the intersections between Black Canadians, young Black Canadians, uh, Black women, all those dimensions uh, are actually when you see the, scale, the systemic nature of the racism, you begin to understand that it's not one monolith of, of people that are uh, facing it. It's not one age group, it's this pervasive thing. And so I think um, it's a very, for me, it was a very moving piece of research because it sort of tried to, it pushes everyone to ask themselves the question, have I really thought this through uh, about the extent to which, whether in my life or in my business, uh, I am actually, uh, there, there, there are places that I should be uh, working harder to address the issue. So I think just, just on a general comment about the report uh, and, but to your question of microaggression, I think, um, you know, it happens in so many, um, and, and maybe I'll start by saying we are already in, in Canada, a, a culture that actually I would say suppresses extremes of emotion. And I say that as come on someone, I grew up in Trinidad, it's a loud, expressive, people talk, uh, we make jokes and, and, but I know that I've had to do my own code switching in the, in the workplace to suppress some of that. And so we already are in a situation of uh, certain emotions and, and issues are subtle. And so it's even more difficult to notice these microaggressions in our society, because on top of that general uh, subtle nature of which we express emotion uh, around a business table, um, I think black Canadians are further um, uh, sort of uh, victim to that, uh, an additional layer. So whether, for example, I know issues, comments about your dress and your hair uh, can translate themselves on a, if, and especially if it's persistent, uh, you know, it is an aggression that, that is oftentimes not intentional to be aggressive, but it, if you have to endure that every day, you start to question your own identity, start to question your own ability, it erodes it way at people's ability to perform and bring, bring their whole self to the workplace. So we know, and you know, there's uh, some of the data in the uh, report speaks about the, the, that impact. Uh, but I could go on much longer about this, and I think I'll just pause right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 thank you uh, for bringing that uh, very important point uh, forward. And uh, let's not forget your initial point, uh, and that is uh, awareness. Awareness is the first uh, step in terms of, uh, of understanding. And uh, uh, we put the uh, link to uh, this uh, uh, report uh, in the chat room. And uh, I just wanted to say to our viewers, it is an easy read. It is uh, uh, provocative in uh, uh, 
how it articulates very clearly uh, the, the issues. And if you're not familiar uh, with the lingo uh, that matters today, uh, credentialism, uh, micro uh, aggressions, code switching, et cetera, uh, I do recommend that you read uh, the report because uh, it gives some very good examples. Uh, you mentioned practically comments about hair, about dress, how individuals are greeted uh, and assumptions when uh, persons enter the room. Uh, very, very good examples articulated uh, here. Nian, uh, I'm gonna, uh, 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 or perhaps Donna, you have something to, uh, to add to, yeah, to that? I was just gonna add something, Todd. I think, um, you know, uh, Leslie, I think really powerful point. And I would also say oftentimes when these examples come out about microaggressions, people usually use the example of one individual making some a stupid comment to another individual. But in actual fact, a lot of these issues are institutional. Sometimes they're ingrained in, in the culture of an organization. And I've seen numerous examples of where an established organization will put criteria in place, which in itself is a microaggression of, uh, against a person of color. For example, I'm aware of someone that today they do uh, modeling contracts and in the contract, it specifically says black natural hair is not allowed. So your natural hair is not allowed. You have to either be wearing, um, you know, weave or something like that. It's a requirement to, to, to do that. Or I know of other situations where young black women are being told by their organization, when you come to work, you cannot wear your hair curly or whatever, it has to be straight. That is the criteria to work in this restaurant or in this store. Like these are situations that are in like policies that actual organizations have today. And this, these are situations that I think that have to be addressed. Thank you. Another very good uh, example, not only in the natural culture of microaggressions, but the systemic uh, microaggression, um, uh, uh, microaggressions that occur in, in policies with respect to dress codes and, uh, and conduct, etc. cetera. Nan, um, perhaps you have some more examples of microaggression, or maybe you can take the, uh, uh, the uh, discussion a little bit further in what is it that uh, civic action and in, in this report, uh, help, how does it help employers address these systemic racism and, uh, uh, and microaggressions in the workplace? Thanks, Todd. I did just want to pile on to what Donna said, because I 100% agree. It's such an important topic. There's such a spectrum of microaggression that we see today. You know, everything as systemic and ingrained institutionally as what Donna was describing, as well as really subtle behaviors all the time, day to day in interactions. And the only point I wanted to make on this is it's so pervasive. It's kind of like the analogy of death by a thousand you know, paper cuts, right? It's when you experience that day to day constantly, it really does break down your ability to feel you can be yourself and at your best. So it's a very, very serious question. But to, to what can we do? And, and what we tried to highlight in the report, as Leslie was saying, what we did is we sort of scoured the globe, if you will. Again, these are not new problems. And, you know, there have been, you know, opportunities and, and uh, solutions that have been tried on small levels all over the world. What we tried to do is compile some of the practices that we thought were most promising. And, and you know, when you have a chance to look at the report, for those of you who haven't, we tried to summarize this as simply as possible in a table format. There's about 32 different practices that we felt are actually, these are worth trying. Why not try them? Just do it. <laughs> There's 32 of them. And maybe I'll highlight a few. And we've already covered some of them, but more in the, in the employment side. So we start with recruiting. And I think, Donna, you, you outlined some of these. Leslie, you mentioned a few too. I mean, it starts with the pipeline and revisiting what pools are you recruiting from? You know, your point, Donna, about, you know, making assumptions about what type of degree or which schools we can go to. Expand that, right? Really think broadly about where can we actually find that breadth of talent that we all need in our organizations that's more diverse than our current pools are giving us. If you're using a third party or an agency, make that a requirement, you know, make it their obligation to bring you a more diverse slate. Don't even look at the slate until you know it's a diverse slate. So that has been done elsewhere and it's working. Um, so why not, why don't we all do that? 
in our respective jobs, in our respective uh, companies. Uh, we've talked about resume screaming and the bias there, the credentializing, so I won't go over that. Leslie, you mentioned making sure that the panel, the interviewing panel, uh, you know, is representative or diverse so that folks can actually, you know, see people that look like them on the panel as well. Beyond recruiting, you know, we also need to look at practices that we have in our organizations to integrate, develop, advance our Black colleagues. So, for example, you know, many, many organizations now are forming employee resource groups. This is a good practice. What it actually does is it encourages and supports uh, communities to, to be able to, to to A, have a community and actually talk to each other and, and, and raise challenges that they see and or just find some, some connections and some role models. But it also provides a platform, if you will, to be able to have the conversation. So ERGs are a, a promising and good practice. In terms of advancements, again, we can look at our slates. Anytime we're considering a promotion, we should make sure that the slate is representative or there is some representation on that slate of a more diverse candidate pool. I think too often we use a lot of shorthand and patterning to say, okay, well, that person's not qualified. That person's not qualified. The next candidate must look like this. And it's pattern based on what we've always seen rather than the actual requirements of the job. So let's make sure that those promotion slates are expansive as well. Another thing that we think is very important is really, really focusing on sponsorship programs. And these need to be done with purpose. They need to be done formally. You can't just sort of let them happen because they don't happen naturally. We know that now, right? There is affinity bias. And you know, our Black colleagues are not getting the benefits of the network and the sponsorship that our non-Black colleagues are getting because there is affinity bias and people tend to look out for people who look like them. They see themselves in them. You know, they see that pattern that they, they want to help. So we need to actually be really explicit and purposeful in designing these sponsorship programs so senior leaders can be more intentional, you know, paired with Black talent, getting to know Black talent, helping navigate that talent's career. These are just a few. As I said, there's a list of 32 in, in the uh, report. <laughs> Thank you, Nan, and that's helpful. And I'll just uh, hold up. I know our viewers can't see it, but I do encourage you when you click on the link to go to page 11 and uh, you can see the chart that Nan was uh, uh, referring to. I've made some uh, notes uh, on it, and uh, it's not just in terms of uh, employer practices, uh, your pipeline and, and, uh, and onboarding, but there are also, and I think rightly so, uh, systemic uh, uh, actions you can take uh, with respect to education, with respect to uh, healthcare uh, for uh, uh, those in the black community and uh, a section here also on policing. And if we've learned anything in the COVID is the blur between what happens to you at home and what happens to you at work, it's, it's all mixed uh, up now. And uh, I think that is another positive part of uh, this, um, uh, this report is that you've gone, uh, it's, you, you focused on the workplace, but also gone on the influencers that happen at, uh, at home uh, in, in society as uh, well. Leslie, I want to uh, move the conversation into another helpful um, tool kit that uh, Civic Action has prepared called Hire Next. Um, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about Hire Next, how employers can get involved uh, in it in order to access uh, a number of, I understand, assessments, case studies, uh, a toolkit, et cetera. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, happy to, Todd, and um, really excited to share. I know that there are already some employers in Brampton who have taken advantage of this tool. So Hire Next uh, is really um, uh, targeted at employers uh, seeking to remove uh, through their recruiting pro uh, practices uh, certain barriers that over years or systemically they have uh, have put in, whether it's in the job description and, or their own um, job ads. And it's as simple as it's a 10 minute assessment uh, that you can do with this tool. Um, it sort of evaluates uh, your hiring practice and, and makes at, at the onset three simple recommendations about three actions that any um, uh, organization can take to begin uh, to uh, break down the barriers. And so it does things like it does, it, it evaluates the job description, it uh, can evaluate the questions for your interview. Um, and uh, at uh, Civic Action Week, we have often gone out to organizations or groups to do a, a bit of a training session in helping uh, the application of the actions. Um, 
right now, I think we have close to 700 employers uh, who have signed up and utilize uh, the tool successfully. And we're really, really happy with the results. And um, we offer training webinars uh, for employers. I would say, you know, really, if, if you're a small to medium sized business and you don't have an entire army of an HR department, this is actually one of the most practical ways you can begin on this journey uh, to transform your organization uh, to address issues of racism uh, in particular. And it was while it was tailored at its inception for um, uh, removing barriers for young people, guess what? A lot of the young people seek, see, um, seeking jobs are black, they're racialized, and they're the ones facing uh, most of the barriers. So it, it, it applies directly. Um, it also offers suggestions around uh, kind of this whole conversation we're having about skills-based, uh, how to evaluate skills-based versus credential-based um, uh, uh, requirements. And um, we've seen uh, some really good uh, success. And I'll, I'll just uh, kind of cite one little example, um, Fix, uh, Fix. There's a software company called Fix. They uh, implemented uh, a couple of our recommendations around their entry-level postings. And uh, specifically, they were targeting because they're in a tech industry wanting to have more youth in, in be more youth inclusive. And as a result of the changes, um, the organization has increased uh, the representation of young talent from 47% to 60%. And retention, interestingly, as well, has increased from 30% to 73%. So we know there's the power of the, you know, uh, you know, the butterfly effect of first making the commitment, taking action, and then uh, sort of the domino that that can create. And so, uh, you know, we're continuing to expand the tool. Uh, we're now in a partnership with Accenture to develop an AI component to further expand the capabilities of the tool. And it's a free tool. Uh, we offer it, uh, you know, we've been able to, with our partners, um, be able to offer it us up uh, across the region. And in some cases, we've been able, uh, we've had folks in Halifax and Calgary who also uh, are able to use the tool. So we're re really thrilled about that. Well, thank you for outlining that. And I'm going to give each of you an opportunity just uh, for some wrap up uh, comments. But I think I'd like to start. I know that a lot of our viewers uh, are um, um, becoming more aware of um, what the situation is uh, for uh, black app applicants and uh, those in uh, the workplace, those in, in, in society. And, you know, they want to find practical ways uh, that they can contribute to making the situation uh, better. And I thank you all for uh, helping us understand uh, and articulating with specific examples and, uh, uh, and concepts of how they can uh, do that. But I guess in terms of my final comment, uh, to kick you all off uh, here in terms of the, the final closing uh, comments is when I look at what is provided in this report from Boston Consulting uh, Group, uh, when I look at the tools that are provided uh, by Civic Action, um, our viewers, um, some may be motivated by saying, you know, this is this is a nice thing uh, to do, treating uh, people equally. Others might say this is the right thing to do from a moral uh, uh, standpoint and a, and a uh, social justice uh, standpoint. And I know that there will be others too that believe that, but should also understand that this is the right thing to do from an innovation development, from a competitive advantage for uh, your, uh, your companies. It is all tied in together and it's not optional uh, anymore. Those companies that do practice and do develop and do learn and make mistakes and try again uh, are the ones that are going to move forward faster and uh, outpace the competition. So um, I'll turn to each of you uh, then, uh, who, who would like to begin in, uh, in, in terms of final closing uh, comments. Donna? You can go next, Todd. I think for me, um, my parting remarks really re um, um, lie in, in the three areas, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I would say that any action that a company is looking to take, they really need to think of it in those three um, realms. So, you know, what equitable practices do you have in play to ensure that people are treated not only with dignity and respect, but fairly and equitably? Diversity, what strategies are you putting in place to ensure that you have a diverse, uh, thriving, you know, population? 
but inclusion, what are you doing to make sure that once you, you know, acquire this diverse and talented population, what are you doing to make them feel included part of the team? What are you doing to help grow their careers? How are you sponsoring them and, and ensuring that they have a line of sight to the future in that organization? Um, so I think those three uh, work in tandem. And I think it's, that's an important thing to note. Very good point. Thank you. Nan? Yeah, I, I, I think that's awesome um, advice, Donna. And I do think we have to think very specifically about all three of those pillars. I mean, maybe I'll just, you know, jump off of where you, where you were going, Todd. I mean, look, in this day and age, there's no longer a question as to is there a business case around inclusivity, around equity, around around diversity. There, there's, there's no it's no longer a question. You know, we used to ponder that question ten years ago. That's yesterday, right? Study after study after study has shown across multiple metrics: return on sales, profitability, engagement, you name it, that diverse teams, inclusive teams thrive and they drive out performance, they drive, you know, business results, et cetera. So it's no longer a question and we all need in this day and age to be performing at our best and be innovative. So that's no longer the question. This is a must do. And it's just a question of how can we do it faster? It's been painfully slow, ridiculously slow. So um, our hope is with this report that, you know, there's, there's facts on the table you know, let, let's now just start and do things more seriously, you know, pick anything, but let's move across all the pillars. It's not a silver bullet. We must actually tackle this problem holistically. And one thing I will say is perhaps there is, you know, an opportunity in time. So we all know this pandemic, um, our, our black communities, our racialized minorities have borne the brunt uh, to a large scale disproportionately of this pandemic in terms of job loss, you know, lost hours, lost wages, in terms of health outcomes. But we will have an opportunity, hopefully very soon, to reinvent the future. You know, as we re-enter work, we can reinvent work, right? We can reinvent conditions for success. We can reinvent those policies and practices and really put that equitable lens across that. So let's seize that moment. Let's use this time to maybe leapfrog because the headwinds have been very, very severe through this pandemic. So we need to actually have very purposeful strategies to, to overcome those headwinds and make more progress. Wonderful. Enough incrementalism. It's time to leapfrog. Uh, thank you for that optimistic encouragement. Uh, Leslie, final comments well, from you. Well, it's hard to be the final comments now. You, <laughs> all these great words of wisdom from Nan and, and Donna. I, maybe I'll just build on uh, Nan's point about t the time is now. I mean, I think there's part, you know, why, I, you know, my commitment to work and change and be and lead civic action is very much on the heels of a lot of what Nana says. The time is now. I believe that um, we can make a difference for this region looking ahead uh, in terms of our idea of ourselves as, you know, we prided ourselves as a city and a country as being, uh, you know, intolerant and diversity is our strength. I think we have to move now to understanding that by addressing issues of racism, we can become a more inclusive to, to progress from diverse and inclusive city region. And, and by uh, these, what I would call practical ways, each and every one of us collectively and cumulatively, uh, we can accelerate and speed it up. And, and uh, but we should not, I mean, I think the only worry I have is that as you know, everyone's talking about it, it seems to be uh, de rigueur to, to uh, see that this is important. We can't allow ourselves to fade away in our uh, commitment and our interests. And so I think, um, you know, there are the, we have the facts, uh, there is work to be done. There's a way forward that's out outlined that anyone can begin. And we just have to continue and persist in that commitment because there's an entire pool of amazing people in the city and this region who are not uh, able to actually step up and make us even greater. So I think good to greater, greater to even more fabulous. That, that's what the journey we're on. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and what uh, great closing comments, uh, Donna. Thank you uh, so much, Donna uh, Pascal, the uh, VP of HR Communication and Public Affairs for Dynacare. Thank you for tying together the importance, uh, uh, not only in, uh, in terms of diversity, but also inclusion and uh, 
throughout each uh, stage of uh, uh, progression in the workplace. Uh, Nan, your uh, optimism and uh, and uh, hope that we can reimagine, reinvent, and uh, not just move in an incremental way, but uh, uh, leapfrog uh, to systemic uh, change. And uh, lastly, a very, very important point that we can each do a little part and collectively teamwork through workplaces, through society, we can make a, a big uh, difference on this issue. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have this conversation uh, with these amazing women uh, today. And uh, thank you for your candor. Thank you for your practical uh, advice and examples. And uh, let this be the beginning of uh, more conversations uh, on this topic. And in that regard, I'd like to wrap things up by letting our viewers know of a couple of other opportunities where we can continue this conversation. On the 25th of uh, March, that's next Thursday at noon, uh, we have our regular weekly member engagement opportunity called Open Door Discussions. Uh, open Door Discussions is Exactly what it uh, says, an opportunity for us to open doors for one another, be it find suppliers, find customers, discuss opportunities that uh, are before us and how we can capture them or challenges uh, to be overcome. That's noon uh, on Zoom call, open door discussions. You can register at BramptonBOT.com. On the 9th of April, we welcome our uh, local MPs, uh, federal MPs. We have a we're on the eve of a major budget coming in the beginning of uh, April, so we will be talking to uh, our local MPs about that, about uh, stimulus uh, for economic recovery and a number of other uh, issues. On the 15th of April, we uh, have uh, over the lunch hour two uh, distinguished uh, executives uh, that have successfully uh, managed and led succession as uh, a succession plan uh, at their manufacturing plant. I'm speaking, of course, of Bob Peacock and Joe Jackman of Elmeg Aluminum Lots. Uh, that They'll be the keynote speakers for our view from the top. And uh, again, not only succession planning, but overcoming of adversity and business challenges, exporting uh, uh, to the states, buying companies in the states, expanding in Brampton. They have such a wealth of information. It should be a wonderful discussion with them. To learn more about these events, uh, visit BramptonBOT.com. Again, thank you for your attention. Thank you to our panelists. And we'll see you again right here on Zoom or hop in or some marvelous uh, method of technology uh, to uh, keep the conversation going and bringing Brampton forward. Thank you so much to our guests. We'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Bye Thanks now. so thank much, you. Todd. Thanks for thank all the best. Thanks, Todd. Really, Thanks really. You, Thank so you. Good to see good. you again. Same here. All the best. We should uh, catch up at some time. I would really like that. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye now.